Well, personally, I think that architectural education should both become broader and more special. At the moment, it's only one thing, and it's a, such a complex process. Business of Architecture, episode 235. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. And if you aren't at a computer, you can also text the phrase profit map, that's two words, to the phone number 773-770-4377. Text the phrase profit map. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the award-winning platform that combines time and expense tracking, billing, project management, accounting, and business intelligence all in one easy-to-use platform. Make your work easy with Core. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Now, before we jump into today's episode, I have a special invitation for you, my loyal podcast listener. Would you like the opportunity to take a turn at being host here on the podcast? I'm now accepting proposals from people who want to contribute an episode or two here to the podcast. This is an excellent networking opportunity for a lucky individual, and you never know, this could turn into other opportunities. If you're interested in being part of an episode as the interviewer here on the show, here's what to do. Send an email to enoch at businessofarchitecture.com. Enoch is spelled E-N-O-C-H. That's my name. Tell me who you propose to interview for the podcast and why you think that you are the right person for the job. Give me your best pitch. That's it. Today, my colleague Ryan Willard takes the microphone and speaks with the celebrated and award-winning founder of Mole Architects, Meredith Bowles. They discuss what it means to run a successful architecture practice and dive into thoughts about how this is done. Now, before we jump into today's episode, I would like to invite you, my faithful listener, to submit a proposal to interview someone here on the Business of Architecture show. So perhaps you have a mentor that you think would make great material for this show. Perhaps there's an influential architect who you'd like to connect with and interview them here, and you want to try your hand at interviewing. Well, if that's the case, I want to get you here right behind the mic. I want to get your voice broadcast to the tens of thousands of architects who listen to this show. If this sounds like something that's of interest to you, here's what to do. Send an email to enoch at businessofarchitecture.com. Tell me who you plan to interview, what value this person will add to our listeners, and why you are the right person to do this. That's it. I'll take a look at the applications, and if it looks like there's a fit, I'll reach out with the next steps and let you know what to do. This could be an amazing networking opportunity for the right person, and I encourage you to go ahead and submit your proposal to me at enoch at businessofarchitecture.com. Now, let's jump into today's show. Good morning and welcome to the Business of Architecture, the UK edition. I'm sitting here with Meredith Bowles. Welcome, Meredith. Hi, Ryan. Who is the principal and founder of Mole Architecture. I'm actually sitting in the incredible British Library this morning, so we've got an appropriate venue for this conversation. Um, Meredith's been uh, the principal founder of Mole Architects for 20 years, you were saying? 20 years we set up. And you've kind of done an, an array of amazing housing projects projects and you've done lots of collaborations you've recently won like a trio of reba reba awards true this year, yeah. um you worked with roger um Slogovich on the the boathouse and it was it was alan de bottom the balancing house that you well alan de bottom's the the founder of living architecture so yeah it was uh winnie mass of mvrdv we work with on the balancing barn yeah and we're currently helping peter zamdor on site with his first house Fantastic. Yeah. Very exciting. Yeah. And you also recently working with Peter Salter and Crispin Kelly on the Warmer Yard. Yeah, which has been an amazing experience, yeah, which finished last year. Brilliant. So a very, very impressive CV and in, in sort of a real kind of uh, an amazing array of collaborations and built projects. So I suppose to begin with, what, how, what would you say is the secret to having like a successful architecture practice or what is a successful architecture yeah, practice? that's a better question actually. What is a successful yeah. architecture practice? Uh, because people have different ambitions. Yeah. So for me, uh, some, most measures of su- success in the world are financial actually. Yes. 
and uh, because it's the easiest sort of tangible thing to um, yeah. I mean, people if you have a big car, people think you're successful. Yeah, and actually, it's one measure of success because if mm. you don't get the finances right, you go out of business. So yeah. whatever your ambitions are, if you don't if you don't manage it correctly, then you're not going to realise your other ambitions. But most architects, of course, you know they get into it because they want to build things, build beautiful things. You know, yeah. you be through you go through college, and that is the measure you you want to build beautiful buildings. Yeah. So uh, the measure of success for me, I suppose, is feeling like I'm in control. Yeah. And uh, as a practice, we're able to uh, have an ambition or a picture of where what we want to do architecturally and yeah. find a way to realize that, Yeah. which is incredibly hard because we are always at the service of other people who have their own ambitions. Their, their, their ambitions are not primarily to follow our architectural path. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, you know, the measure of success is whether or not you've got a sequence of, of buildings that you've managed to get built, Yeah. which is important for me, getting them built, not just the ideas, mm. um, uh, and while staying in business. Ideally, on top of that, you, you, you make money, but that's a secondary concern for me. Yeah. And how, how have you sort of structured your company then to enable that to sort of to happen, to emerge? I guess it's grown organically over time, yep. trying to find uh, the right people to work with. Yep. So like many small practices, I start, you know, I set up on my own, decided I wanted to, to do it myself. Um, actually, I did have an a earlier practice with two friends from college between part one and part two. Um, but after that, we, I set up on my own and, and um, would love to have had a partner, but could never find anyone who was mad enough to <laughs> work with me um, to share the burden, if you like, yeah. um, and the risks. Yeah. Um, and by now, I've got a fellow director who's now worked with me for 10 years, right. and uh, Ian Bramwell. So Ian now runs the business with me, which yep. uh, is fantastic f uh, for me, you know, to be able to... Um, share the difficulties and mm. responsibilities with someone else and by now I have two associates who um, also have responsibility so you know there's there's four of us really who are running the business and now you know over the 20 years I suppose Ian started taking that role on about four years ago yeah so in 16 years it was basically myself and employing architects and architectural assistants and so on so pretty you know a pretty steep pyramid if you like yeah yeah and what how's that how has it changed then for you in terms of like creating that successful practice now you've got other people that you're sharing it with and what's what what makes a successful business relationships or business team yeah. it's that's a good question it's uh the the reason it changed is that there was one year where i lost money right and uh, it was when I'd quite quickly grown from sort of five or five, six people up to about 12 to 15 people. I won, yeah. a, big, uh, I won a big contract abroad in, in Taiwan in the Far East and um, had to quickly expand to take that on. And uh, the difference of running the, bi you know, the business of 12 people from five or six was quite dramatic. Mm. And... Um, I hadn't put in place the structures to allow other people to become fully responsible right. for, the, for running the, the work, especially the financial side of it. Um, and I no longer had time to do everything previous to that. Like many sole practitioners who then employ people, I just carried on doing everything, you know. Um, so that was, the, that was what prompted it. I um, lost, uh, lost money one year and um, realized that if that, carried on I would go out of business yeah I better do something quickly about it yeah so I employed a business consultant right hit, hit, um, architectural business uh, consultant um, and uh, which cost quite a lot of money yeah and um, learned a few things from him um, about how to how to structure mm. uh, a business and how to manage finances and understand our worth and try and get people to pay for it yeah um so that that led to a real significant uh, change in giving giving the senior members responsibility for mm. resourcing their jobs it's quite yeah. simple yeah 
And what are, what, are, what other things were, did you learn through that, using that business consultant that really kind of started to transform how you were operating? Or you say you kind of were learning to kind of express what your value was or know how to communicate your, how much yeah. your services were worth. What, what, can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's quite, I mean, it's all down to, um, uh, it's all down to the contract you, you first of all sign. Yeah. Um, and going through with your client. So a really good tip, he said, is um, when you get your agreement, go through it line by line with your mm. client, which kind of I, I was to some degree, but I do so much more specifically now to make it clear to them that you're serious about everything that's in there. Yeah. And some of the things that are in there is that what happens when things don't go quite according to plan, which they don't in our business. Yeah. Um, and making it clear that we have uh, a fee which is set up for uh, how things sh should work. But when things go, go slightly awry, which might not be the architect's fault, if it's the architect's fault, we have to bear the consequences of it. Mm. Um, it costs us more time. Yeah. Our business is wholly about time. That's, yeah. that's it. You, they pay for our time. And so you have to build in structures to get fees for the additional work. Right. Uh, and if you don't go through it with a client and make it really clear and talk directly about money, not be afraid to talk about money, it becomes really difficult to then broach the subject mm. at the time you need to, when it's fraught and yeah. difficult and embarrassing. Yeah, and rather than it being done up front when it was kind of like a safer... Yeah. So that was a really good tip. Yeah. You know, talk it through. Uh, and before it happens, say, you know, refer back to your contract, to your agreement, and say, you know, this is, this is going to cost you a bit more money. Um, so we'll be billing you next month for more fees. Mm. Uh, then you can do it. Yeah. If you try and do it after the event, you get into an <laughs> argument. And of course, if you haven't, you know, they're the ones with the money, they've got the power. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And why do you think this is kind of missing with lots of, lots of architects, like this fear, for example, of, of being able to talk about money in, in business? Yeah, I... I think this goes back a long way, actually. If mm. you think about the origins of uh, architecture being practiced as a kind of gentleman's hobby. Yeah. Uh, from the, sort of days of Henry VIII, yeah, really. Yeah, from the 18th or 18th century. Yeah. Um, it's, there's a, a slight hangover of that, I think. Yeah. And, um, you know, also if you think about the context of architecture being taught in universities of it being a commercial venture and so not really academic. And there's, mm. a slight, there's a slight sort of embarrassment that actually we're a, we're a commercial, you know, it's a commercial venture. It's, yeah. it's not actually art. It's not actually a ac proper ac academic um, uh, subject. Uh, and so we, we remain, I think, slightly caught between those two sides. And well, it's even, the, re even until recently, you know, you w architects weren't supposed to advertise. Exactly. So it's I mean, kind of like... That was in, you know, that's during the time I've been in practice. Yeah. Where, you know, eventually we were allowed to, under the code of contact to, to, to advertise. But it remained for a long time. If you were a proper architect with lofty ideals, you mm. wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be doing that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't advertise. That's for the commercial architects who, yeah. who, who don't care about uh, aesthetics. You know? <laughs> so, and They've that, sold out. They've sold, yeah, yeah. That remains, I think, that, that sense that actually... Um, uh, our our ideals are above commercialism. Yeah, uh, it, it, it remains with us. Yeah, I suppose the the other side, which is a more positive spin on it, is that architects, through our education, rightly think we have a social responsibility mm. beyond uh, beyond the b particular building that we're looking at, and certainly beyond our venture as a business. Yeah, and. Um, you know, I think that's good. I think that someone needs to have a social responsibility, especially now where the state is divesting itself of all responsibility, yep. it seems. But who is going to take responsibility for the development of our cities in a way that is good for people? Yeah. But it does mean that, that architects, because of that side of our nature, that we feel we should be doing good, Yeah. that we, we, that doesn't rub it doesn't, well. Yeah, it's not compatible with money. The, yeah, yeah. So there's lots of reasons, I think, why there's an there's a embarrassment or a nervousness, aside from the fact that we're not well equipped through education and mm. how to run businesses, yeah. um, as to why we might be reluctant to even talk about it. Yeah. So how have you sort of navigated that sort of 
you know, being a commercial practice or, you know, winning work? How have you yeah. kind of gone around establishing relationships and actually winning those? It's always interesting to ask actually like how you were winning projects 20 years ago to yeah, how you're yeah. winning projects now. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the big, you know, that's the thing that worries everyone all the time. It worried me when I set up, you know, how, how am I going to get work? And it worries me now, how am I going to get work? You yeah. Know? You think the bigger you get, the easier it will become. It's just the, 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 the gamble becomes larger, that's yeah. all. And you see bigger practices who are losing 20 staff in one go or mm. conversely gaining 20 staff in one go. And, um, you know, I think that's a real, our, this problem we have in our industry about fee bidding yeah where we're 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 putting cutthroat fees in to win work from one another is meaning that we have no resilience in business no one's building up big reserves so when something happens we've got yeah, nothing when to we don't win the work we're hoping to win uh, we're able to keep our staff on I and mean, that's a real yeah real issue anyway how do we how do we so i was asking how, yeah work? yeah so in, um, when I set up, I was fortunate uh, in that I was working for a, I was working for, um, a chap in, in London who decided to stop practicing. Yeah. And um, he was an, a designer, developer, architect. And um, so he gave me some clients who were based in Hampstead and I did back extension mm. kind of residential work that um, uh, Tom Brent, his name is Tom Brent, um, who continues to be a developer, he passed on to me. So that, that was enough to do sort of half a business. Yeah. And then I'd um, been working as a construction manager on a, on a, on a site for Tom where we were um, both building and, and managing uh, uh, residential refurbishment jobs for Tom's yeah. clients and I got on well with the contractors I also set up a small contracting company uh, with with uh, Michael who's the head carpenter right um, doing uh, so we did design and build for right. our, you know when when um, the east end of London was beginning to do out loads of warehouses into, into cool apartments we yeah. did a number of those um, so that's how I started, really. And then, and then, and from there, how how do you sort of broach winning new work now? So, um, word of mouth was a part of it. The problem with residential work is that mm. you you don't know. You, you can't go out. You don't know where your clients are going to be. <laughs> you can't knock on houses. And yeah, it's of, very... Well, you could, but... <laughs> it's really hard. Um, other sectors, you know, if you say you wanted to do schools work, well, you know who funds schools and you yeah. know where the schools are. So yeah. you could target them with residential work, which is I, that's what I my practice was um, founded on. And mm. It's very difficult to know how you do it. So the only thing... Uh, I felt I could do is um, other than tap into everyone I knew to make sure everyone knew that I was you know available for work uh, was to do work that was good enough so it could get published yeah and therefore and win awards and yep. um, uh, get attention that way and that did work actually yeah um, it did work so I got people uh, coming to me who I didn't know uh, through editorials advertising right. interestingly was was hopeless so early on i advertised in quite a lot of places what kind of adverts were you putting together so this or? was um well i moved, when i moved out of london i even advertised in the yellow pages I right took, i looked at magazines who i thought might have the kind of clientele with a bit more money and yep. put adverts in magazines i think i once put an advert in grand designs mag when that was yeah new and by and large, I got the wrong kind of people from mm. those. Not, you know, not jobs that I particularly wanted. It's mm. not that I'd got no inquiries, but they weren't really getting what, what I wanted, you know, the clients I was after. So probably I took on some jobs which had simply enabled me to stay in business. Yeah. Um, which is true, I did. So things that, you know, no one would ever know that I did. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's why I'm still here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and um, but they it wasn't until I started getting editorial in um, so the magazines were talking about me then people would make a telephone call yeah 
<clears throat> and so, and so now you, you're you're collaborating a lot with other architects, and you also mentioned that you've you've sort of you've ventured into development before, but perhaps felt that wasn't the right path for you. Yeah. So I guess earlier on, you, I was trying everything to stay in business in a way. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, by now we're much more focused on what we're what we're aiming to do. But uh, early on, it's just a question of staying in business. Mm. So from working with uh, with Michael on as a as a design and build contractor, um, I mean, I've always loved buildings. So. Yeah. But I bought a house. I bought a site to build a house in London. Right. And um, at the point where I decided to move out of London, I got planning permission for that site. But then realised there was land next door to it. So I, ma- I managed to do a deal on the land next door and got planning permission for eight houses instead of one. Mm. And I was going to develop it, but at the point where I moved out of London, I realised that the real value was in the the land uplift on the planning permission yeah so, and actually so it's a lot it's a lot less riskier much less risk so i sold that um and bought land outside of london near cambridge where i moved out to and um did one one house as a speculative development um and thought about that seriously as about a, a way of um running a business yeah you know buying land getting planning permission building something selling it on and lots of architects have done that really mm. successfully. But it's really hard work. Yeah. And actually, out where I was in Cambridgeshire, the kind of, the, the number of clients who would want something really interesting that I would mm. be interested in designing yeah. are far fewer than in London. So the risk of doing something that was outlandish, which is what I like to do, yeah, uh, and not selling it was pretty high. So if you're going to do a development company then like most development companies you have to pitch somewhere in the middle ground to increase your likelihood of selling it yeah Um, unless you're in an area where you're likely to find those particular people who will buy something unique interesting architecturally challenging yeah so i decided against that as a as a path um where, where, and, where were we going with that? Well, I was, I was uh, yeah, asking kind of why you decided, you think you answered it pretty succinctly, why you decided not to sort of pursue development as a, like an alternative business model. Yeah. And it's much more about actually that you want to be doing the kind of designs, the impactful designs yeah. that you want to be making. And, then, yeah. and, so, and so from there, how did you, how do you sort of ensure that you do work with the right clients where you can kind of fulfill on your design intentions and your yeah. sort of ideas? And, and if you can say a little bit more about the sort of the collaborations, because I think that's really, yeah. that's a really powerful way of sort of yeah. supercharging your, your practice, if you like. like. Yeah, actually, that came as a surprise. I remember I went to the RIBA small practice conference, yeah. which is now called Guerrilla Tactics. Yes. Um, after I'd been in practice about four or five years and um initially i was a bit sniffy i was saying you know why would i want to go to that it's full of other architects you know they, they're not <laughs> going to give me work you know i shouldn't be wasting my time there i should be you know going out tapping up developers or whatever yeah and uh it was what was surprising is the 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 sense of support mm. mutual support that our profession uh, gives each other a brilliant talk by Paul Monaghan of AHMM, who um, was in the year above me at university and by right. that time had got a very successful <coughs> practice. And he gave a talk, which I now give, because I yeah. know how useful it was to me, about exactly following the path backwards to find out where his work came from. Right, okay. So he was looking at healthcare jobs. Yep. And he went all the way back to a point where they... Um, almost knocked on the door of a small uh, local surgery and did some refurbishment work of their waiting room. Yeah. And how through contacts, it's all about contacts. Yeah. Uh, well, contacts and experience. Um, how that then led to being trusted and doing something bigger. And, you know, by the time he's giving that talk, doing uh, larger healthcare buildings. Mm. And I found that really uh, fascinating. And at the same conference, bumped into a couple of architects who I had known from college, in fact, who yeah. were now running good practices. Um, and we talked about working together. Actually, I'm not sure that any of them came off at that point, but it gave mm-hmm. me the understanding or a thought that actually architects can be my friends yeah. in the business. Yeah. Um, and it's tr- proved to be, to be true quite surprisingly. Yeah. Um, 
So my first sort of non-residential project was given to me by uh, the University of Cambridge, Department of Architecture. It was the, two, the, the head, Marcia Leshenique, and Alan Short, who was head of the building committee, mm. uh, got the university to employ me to do their building in a way that wouldn't ever have happened if it was simply a, the, you know, a normal sort of building committee um, uh, non-architect yeah. deciding who should do the job because clearly I was I uh, was uh, I didn't have the necessary I- experience and was probably incapable yeah but of course an architect knows the capabilities of someone and the chances are is it wasn't a particularly complicated building and simply because I hadn't done a building type like that before yeah. doesn't rule me out so it was through them that I got that building through another architect who, That's really, yeah. who said I you know put he can do the job you know that's really interesting, actually, because often it's kind of <coughs> counterintuitive sometimes that we think that actually, no, I'm not, I don't want to talk with other architects, I need to go and meet other people. Actually, when there's a, uh, that collaborative effort involved, yeah. and I've won a lot of work from architects who are further along the path than yeah. me, when I start reaching out and having a conversation and then they pass you on a exactly. bit of work. Exactly. And it's, it's, a, it's, it, it's a strategy that, that works. Yeah, that, talking to each other. Yeah. Is a really is a really good thing. Actually, that's the that's the biggest bit of advice mm. in business is um, is just talking mm. to uh, you know getting to know anyone and everyone. Yeah, um, I remember um, Glenn Merkett, who was a mentor of mine. Yeah, uh, he was once described as a socialist by principle and socialite. Uh, no, sorry, social <laughs> socialite by necessity, socialist by principle. You know, and, and uh, Glenn is a wonderful man, but yeah. a lot of his work is individual one-off homes for rich clients. So, you know, that's his market, and so he has to go out and, and meet those people. Otherwise, he's, he has no work, but that's not who he is really in yeah. his principles. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, that um, necessity to keep uh, all channels of communication open mm. uh, and follow-up leads... Um, have conversations with with people because you never know where it might lead. Yeah, actually, ninety percent of them don't leave anywhere. Yeah, you know, but actually, you had a good conversation, and you know, it was quite interesting anyway. So, what have you lost? But ten percent might might lead on to something. Yeah, and you have an introduction of an introduction of an introduction that suddenly yeah. turns into a project. So, the idea that you sit at home, you're, you're brilliant, and therefore you'll be successful, is a, is such a, a, a common misnomer for, for all creative people. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, actually, probably ten percent, fifteen percent is the brilliance people that are in business. Mm. Uh, you know, when you know, when you see those really pushy people who are a bit obnoxious, yeah, they're probably the ones that are going to succeed. Yeah, <laughs> sadly, yeah. Uh, and so we have to learn from those people. Yeah, uh, if you if you're a, if you are a, you know creatively talented and you want a slice of the cake, you've got to you've got to get on the other side of it as well. You, yeah. You've got to realize that you also have to, have to be pushy and put yourself out there and sell yourself. You yeah. Know, it's a, and go out of your comfort zone and actually, like, like you say, make, make yeah. the co- contacts, make yeah. the connections. Yeah. So that kind of collaborative work has, has in some ways uh, come about through um, following up possibilities and mm. realizing that it's quite interesting. Yeah. And it was a sort of accident. I met Alan de Botton through, through my wife, who's an author, so they shared an agent. So right, okay. Alan was, um, <coughs> had just written the book. Um, uh, the Architecture of Happiness. Called the Architecture of Happiness, yeah. which is a brilliant primer for first-year architects. Actually, yeah. Way better than, than any other, I think, because it, it talks about architecture from a kind of uh, human point of view. Yeah, yeah. It kind of goes into why we're building the kind of sort of the emo- emotional drivers for yeah. why people are sort of... It's really good. Actually, as an aside, we got a job in Taiwan that was the, that doubled the size of my practice. Right. Uh, in effect, through Alan de Botton's book, The Architecture of Happiness, uh, in a weird way, because the chairman's daughter of the development company in Taiwan, the chairman's mm. daughter lived in Cambridge, was doing a PhD, saw a house that I'd done and really liked it, read The Architecture of Happiness realized that Alan de Botta was doing this living architecture 
uh, houses. Went to stay in the Balancing Barn and yeah. found out that the same architect, Mole Architects, whose house she'd seen in Cambridge, was also involved in building the Balancing Barn. And phoned me up and said, do you fancy doing a project in Taiwan? I mean, things come about in such a roundabout way. Yeah. And if you're not kind of putting things out there into the into the world, then nobody's ever going to make exactly. those connections and link exactly. it back to you. Yeah. So how do you... We were talking earlier about, about you know, the, the often practices always want to get to the next level. They want to start taking on projects which are, you know, they haven't done before, but they've, they know they've got the thinking and the skill sets to be able to do it. And obviously yeah. when other architects are involved in the commissioning process, there's a kind of like almost like a, a handout that yeah. can kind of, you know, another architect can vouch for you and say, yeah, these guys are good. But how do, how would you su- suggest or how has your practice gone about moving from one sector to another or gaining yeah. projects which were, you know, previously out of your reach? Yeah, is it, that's a really, really uh, good question because it is so hard. I think to shift, uh, to, to, to get people to believe that you can do something that you don't already do is really yeah. hard. And that's built into the system of, um, of tendering and, and procurement. So most organizations end up having a PQQ that they, they, they have you list. Basically, if, you've, if you haven't done the same building three times before in the last three years, you're yeah. off the list. You know, it's a real struggle. So you have to keep going and see any opportunity to um, take on something that you haven't already done, yeah. which enables you to say, you know, we work in the following sectors. You know, genuinely, we work in the following sectors. Um, so we've just followed up opportunities for a sailing club, but again, through another architect, mm-hmm. it was um, Kay Hughes, um, who um, used to be the um, architect uh, procuring architecture for the Olympic uh, Authority. Yeah. But she happens to belong to a sailing club and, you know, they needed an architect and she wanted someone good on the list and yeah. suggested us as a local practice. Um, but the other way is... Uh, Possibly the only, you know the only clear way is um, is working alongside other architects who themselves can have already got can that prove experience that they have the experience, and uh, so it has to be a big enough project yeah. for the for the other you know the larger practice to think that it might be possible for them to accommodate that or even a good idea to accommodate it within this, the fee and the scale of work yeah because it's quite it adds a level of complication that you need to have sufficient fees to cover yeah. Or that they see that there's something in your practice that might be beneficial for them, and so they might be better off, you know, more likely to win the bid if mm. they include uh, not just themselves but other people. Yeah, um, which you know is often is a is a reasonable case that can be put forward. And we've done that a number of times, both in competition and and uh, in actual jobs, and been successful. So that's part of the conversations to ha- keep going with other architects who you know to think that you might be in a position mm. to collaborate with them at some point. Yeah. The other thing I'd say is that actually w- is not to have too much arrogance or hubris, um, and think that you actually do have something to learn in order to do the other work. Mm. So um, there might be a, a good reason why clients would be nervous to employ architects who have never worked on in a particular field before. Yeah. And even a small shift. So from we've, we've you know, spent 10 years doing housing but uh, or houses, but the shift from houses to housing, I mean, there's another whole big uh, amount to learn, especially on a commercial side of it you yeah know, it, what what the conversations you have with clients who are building housing especially commercial clients who are building housing up and what are the regulatory f- frameworks so actually doing competitions is a good way to familiarize yourself with all of the things that you need to consider when you're shifting sideways yeah it's not it's not that we can't do it architects are amazingly capable but actually you have to demonstrate that you're yeah and any well. any point something they're very critical is actually understanding what the client's concerns are about why they yeah. wouldn't you know and perhaps actually if that was a, a sort of a real thing that we took on was to try and understand what, what is it that the clients are really concerned about like genuinely rather than us having our yeah. opinion about it yeah. understanding where the client's concerns are why they don't want to use an architect yeah. and actually having that conversation that conversation in itself could be something that opens up something new yeah. and that kind of 
makes a bridge almost. Yeah. No, I think the, the RIBA recently did something about uh, um, uh, r- surveys on perception of, of architects from yeah. other people's uh, perspective. Yeah. Uh, which was a rude awakening to a lot of architects, I think. Um, and a realization that, uh, ha- you know, how we are viewed, which is often uh, not understanding, not even attempting to understand yeah. things from a client's perspective. Uh, and going back to that idea of uh, architects feeling that, that we're responsible for something beyond the work itself or beyond our client, that we're protecting the environment or we're looking out for society. Yeah, but actually, we're, you know, the client is employing us and paying us a fee to work for them. So yeah. to a certain extent, that other stuff has to remain hidden. Uh, it's secondary from their perspective, yes. certainly. Um, to what they're asking us to do. Yeah. And I think architects would do well to really try and understand things from their clients' perspective, future potential clients' perspective, in order to be able to be seen as having a conversation that engages. Mm. I think that's really, actually really important. Yeah, yeah. And, and where do you, how do you see the sort of the future of the profession going in, in terms of like... Do you think there is something missing in our education where like entrepreneurship and business needs to be sort of addressed at an earlier stage? Yeah. Or is there something in the education that perhaps is causing a very sharp um, yeah. separation between you know, the academic world and then the professional world and then the commercial world? Yeah. And how can, we, how can we successfully bridge that in the, in the future, particularly as we're sort of moving into this kind of digital economy and where education is like... You know, it's people can self-educate online, or people are starting up design practices, and they don't have any yeah. experience as such. I think we're in a really bad way, actually, mm. um, in terms of the future of the profession. I think that the the profession decries our um, the, the loss of our centrality in the process of building, yeah. and um, but they don't wish to do anything about it. Yeah. So they simply want to have our status back. <laughs> That's it. They don't really, don't really want to take on, uh, take on the role that would give us the central status, which yep. is about management. Yeah. Uh, they want and leadership. To, really, leadership. They yeah. just want to do good design. Yeah. Uh, and so, if that's going to be, if that's going to be addressed, the profession and therefore the the education. So people going into the profession need need to expand what architecture mm. and architects are. So multidisciplinary practices which often stem from uh, engineering practices or project management practices QSs yeah uh, they're taking on that role and the architect is seen as costing the client money yeah and a specialist potentially even add-on but a specialist within uh, a, a, a wide s- a circle of consultants which yeah. will include fire consultancy acoustic consultants and design as a specialism yeah uh, that's how we are becoming uh, as a profession, a specialist add-on. Yeah. So, fine, there's always a role, I think, for, there'll always be a role for, for um, people that want to have really extraordinary buildings. Uh, and I think that the design end of the profession will probably be safe in retaining uh, a place mm. and having status and uh, a security for, for, for those probably one or two percent of, of uh, potential you know people building buildings that, that want something special yeah but in terms of the provision of the rest of it the other 98 percent the architects are in danger of completely losing out yeah and um, we, we do lose control if we don't if we don't retain that role of uh, project management and financial control yeah um, so you know, what do you do about that? Well, personally, I think that um, architects, architectural education should both become broader and more specialist. Yeah. At the moment, it's only one thing, and it's a, such a complex uh, process. The, the idea that everyone is educated in the same way is crazy. It's bonkers. Yeah. You know? So the second degree, which they're talking about how we should arrange it, at the moment we have a generalist first degree and then a generalist second degree. So the, the second degree, I think, should be allow some people to become experts in, con, in, in conservation, others yep. become facade uh, designers, yep. but others to become project managers. Yep. So there's, 
we can all think of uh, people we were at college with who weren't particularly good designers but may, might make brilliant project managers. Yeah. Well, why not make that part of what architects do? Mm. We always used to do it. So the profession now, actually through lack of uh, control within the process, especially contractual process, yeah. are losing out. Well, the, you know, the system, the contractual system mm. um, uh, of, of managing the building process. Yeah. Because it's done by others. It's done by project managers who, you know, we can quite easily take on that role. Yeah. And that should happen in-house. You know, it's mad, really, that bigger practices don't have a whole section. They should, you know, we should be employing QSs in-house. We should be employing project managers. Yeah. So, you know, the future of the profession and education, I think it's in danger of being completely marginalized. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, becoming an add-on. It's just, yeah. yeah. And, and, and how do you think in terms of, like, having more accessibility into the profession... So it's, you know, at the moment, it's, it's a very long incubation period for the architect that you end up, as you say, kind of, you, you, everyone is doing the same sort of thing and it doesn't have that breadth. Yeah, it yeah. has the breadth maybe, like, academically, where you might, you know, a particular progressive universities might have you looking at all sorts of bizarre things. Yeah. But in terms of having breadth of accessibility, do you think there are other ways where actually practices should be responsible for education as well yeah i think it's a really interesting uh, model that the london school of architecture has started yeah. um and uh, sheffield university is doing it as well i don't doubt there are others but it's bound to it's bound to expand um yeah. and i think that's a good thing so um sasha edmonds is one of my associates and she did the whole of her um education part-time whilst working in fact in a in a contractor's design office so took her nine years instead of seven, but during those nine years, she was working and gaining experience. Yeah. So, you know, actually, she came out with no debts. She came out with um, being hugely employable. She's, yeah. Uh, you know, she's very um, skilled yeah. in comparison to most people coming out of their education. Mm. And at the same time, you know, got a first and a distinction at, at, uh, in, in academic design work. So, yeah. That's a model which uh, I think uh, yeah, should be. Yeah, a great be combination, yeah. You know, so there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to, as a profession, mm. um, assist in, in that because it would benefit us both as individual practices uh, as well as, you know, as a wider social enterprise. Yeah, brilliant. That's absolutely fantastic. We just run, about, run out of time, but thank you so much for joining me this morning and for sharing your wisdom. It's oh, been Ryan, thanks. Absolute pleasure. It's been, been good. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, get access to my free four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. You can also get it by texting the phrase profit map, that's two words, to the phone number 773-770-4377. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects. Peter Drucker famously said, what's measured improves. BQE Core lets you easily measure your key financial performance indicators, and it's dead simple. Get insights on the profitability of your firm with a beautiful and easy to customize graphical dashboard. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm and keep your hard-earned profit. And they have pricing structures that work for the smallest of sole practitioners to the largest of firms. Learn more and get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.